Um, adapting content for M Learning, really, it's adapting content for the mobile user, though. I mean, M Learning or or mobile marketing, I think a lot of the same tenants, especially in this presentation, will definitely be applicable. So if you're not a, a learning focused professional and you're more in the, the marketing side of things, there's still a lot of great content. So please don't dash out yet. At least let me get a few slides in. It's okay. <laughs> no, it's no, no problem though. I'd rather I walked out in front of you. That's fine. Yeah. You, Chuck, you can, you can do whatever you want. You got it. <clears throat> he might turn off my Wi-Fi if I'm not nice to him. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm Chad. Uh, I'm managing director here at Float. Um, I also uh, blog uh, really at, very often at floatlearning.com. So if you haven't been you know, following us over the last year, year and a half, um, definitely encourage you to do that. We've got over 100 really great, useful posts. We continue to post there um, basically two to three times a week. And then we've got a really fantastic monthly newsletter, um, which has actually over the last couple months has dealt a, a lot about um, kind of where marketing and learning blend together. You know, the educational aspects of marketing and brand advocacy and building that inside of your customer base. So if you're not a subscriber already, I definitely would welcome you to, to do that. You can tweet at me um, at Visual Rinse, and visualrinse.com is my uh, personal blog. Uh, unfortunately, not writing there that much anymore, but my academic writings typically are going up there. So how to teach about web design and things like that. So today what we're going to cover is... Um, really the basics of the term context. So hopefully, you know, this has been a phrase that you've kind of heard bubble a little bit today. Most people here are at least aware of the, the somewhat of the importance of how a user's context can affect how they are able to use and, and decipher and, and then leverage that information later. Um, and then there are certain types of cons constraints that are at play um, when you take into things like their context inferring that there's limited connectivity or they have a small screen size or they don't have a smartphone or so on and so forth, right? There's a lot of different kind of aspects that affect this, this funky C word of context. And then hopefully we'll understand coming out of here how we can more effectively leverage the user's context so that it's not an obstacle but rather actually a, a, a tactical advantage that we can use to, um, to our advantage when we're deploying either learning or marketing content. Let me start out by contrasting it really with the worst case scenario, and that is, uh, this is from UHF, that's Stanley Spadowski. Um, he ran a game show where the big prize was that you get to drink from the fire hose. Yeah. And I, I think really after you see little Billy here who's in a cowboy hat getting blown away, you realize that nobody really wants the fire hose. And that is especially true when it comes to something like mobile content. Letting someone go hog wild in your LMS with access to every single course that you've put out there, letting someone have unfettered access to an uncurated content management system where there's just thousands and thousands of pages and, and just no thought has been given to what the user is actually experiencing when they're accessing this on a small screen with limited bandwidth and, and totally different gestural inputs, that's basically about as bad as you can get, you know? If you think about it, there's just no concept of the user experience, right? There's no framing, there's no curation, the content hasn't been culled down, so they have no way to focus and determine what's being um, deemed important by the, the content gods. There's been no content strategy applied. Um, there's been no guide that's been placed in front of them to allow the user to make informed decisions on how to access the information that is most important to them at that time. It's, it's awful, right? No thought of the context. So what is this context? Um, I like to boil it down into some, kind of some simple journalistic terms. It's the where, when, and why. Um, you know, where being the setting, both a physical and also a social. Um, the, the time being a relative unit of measure and also an absolute point in time. And then also the intent, which is the, the reason that the person is accessing that information. So when we're talking about setting, you know, things that we need to consider, just some examples, some hypotheticals are, there's a difference between when you're at home and when you're traveling about what you want off your company's intranet, right? There's a difference when you're sitting at your home computer, what you want from American Airlines website and what you want when you're in the airport. There is a difference when you access your learning management system or your customer relationship management system when you're at your desktop in your office than when you're actually out on a job site or about to walk into a client contact's office, right? Big difference. 
if you just think about how this is important, you know, just for a split second, you realize pretty quickly that if this particular aspect of context is leveraged properly, then you can provide a bullet list of hot button topics that the sales salesperson needs to remember before meeting this particular individual. You can provide flight and gate arrival information up front as soon as you know that they walk onto the premises of an airport. You can provide just a far more focused user experience only purely based off of the setting. If they could somehow tie the geolocation to Wikipedia or IMDB so that it knows if I'm at a tavern, I would win at movie trivia all the time. <laughs> you know, I mean, just think about that. It's just some, there's, there's an app for that. There's gotta be, I, I would think that, that it's coming. Somebody in Silicon Valley is probably coding very ha handily away at that right now. Another aspect of context, this concept of time. Time can be a relative unit of measure. You know, it's the proximity to another event. It's, you know, my daughter's already telling me it's a month and a half away from her birthday. You know, and then the next week it'll be, it's five weeks away from my birthday, Dad. Did you know that? And then when we move into the next month, hey, it's my birthday month, right? So this is relative to this other, other event. Um, and I say that that's relative unit of time because your birthday is not my birthday. It's not, right, no, your birthday is not my birthday. It's not your birthday, it's, right? It's, it's relative to all of us. Your anniversary is not my anniversary, but somehow or another, you know, um, Hallmark gets it right every time that they send me a newsletter or something like that, warning me of upcoming anniversaries and, and birth dates and things like that that I should be aware of. It'd be nice if they would alert me when I'm actually walking by the stores at the strip mall too, but somehow they haven't written a piece of software to do that yet. But it's also a very absolute unit of time, right? Right now it's 3.22 p.m. on was it June 10th, 2011. Good. I, I think I just passed some sort of level of, of uh, competency test there just by, by reciting that. But it's an absolute point in time, right? This time is not that time. This time will never be repeated again. This time that's in the future um, that is impending is never going to be ha is never going to happen again. And then three days before New Year's Day, you'd think, oh, that's a that's a relative unit of time, Chad. This flies in the face of what you just said about birthdays and so on and so forth. But we all know that January first is always New Year's Day, right? And that because because it's not impacted by like something like a leap year, three days before New Year's Day is always the uh, the 29th of December, right? Yeah, exactly, right. Like, I'm, I'm not very good at. Math. But, um, you know, and then it's always it happens at a specific time every single day, 10 p.m. I know that I have to turn my media comm box to 771 to watch Jon Stewart on The Daily Show. Okay? So that is the time, the context of time. You can understand how this would be important. Um, someone may have to, on every second Tuesday, log into the LMS and take a compliance course. Someone may need to say, for example, every, I don't know, in the month of January, take a specific refresher on safety or something like that. All of these types of dates and instances can be tracked down and can actually be targeted. And if you've got something like a mobile device, these types of times can actually be tracked, uh, especially when you ta target them to a specific t uh, location. Say, on 5 p.m., if you're at the office, send me a text message that tells me to fill in my time report. I don't know. That one's for you, Matt. Just kidding. <laughs> Thumbs up. Thumbs up back there. And then, you know, I mean, take a look here. For one person, they're talking about a, a, a context of time being a very small slice, and for one person, it's a very long slice. So kind of the length of time can actually be a relative unit of, or piece of context as well. <clears throat> Intent. So the intent uh, with the, which the person wants to access this information, this is probably one of the most difficult aspects of concept, context to just grasp or just get from the user. It's really difficult to infer. I mean, I search for some really weird stuff on Google because I'm always developing things. So Google always thinks that I have typos in my search. And I'm like, no, that's really how you spell that word. It's just a weird acronym. So, you know, it, even Google doesn't necessarily always get that right, is what I'm saying. It's difficult to infer. Other types of things that you can do is you can determine someone's intent in relation to proximity of other devices. 
when you talk about adding all of these new sensors to devices, whether it be something as old-fashioned as Bluetooth or as new as near-field communications, when you start to talk about how close certain things are in each other to a relative space, you can begin to infer the intent in which people access information off of these particular servers or services inside of an office, right? You know that if someone pulls up the app for the printer and they're in the conference room, they're probably checking to make sure that the uh, print job that they sent at 10 o'clock in this, the morning is going to be ready for their, their meeting. You know if they pull up the printer app when they're right by the printer itself, they may actually want to call the printer manufacturer because that job never got finished or they want to call their IT person up there to figure out what happened with that particular printer. This depends very heavily on use of device sensors and usage. Um, you know, so like your search history can factor importantly into that. Hopefully, you know, my, my iPhone spell check gets smarter and understands that my name is spelled a particular way and my friend's birth dates are written a particular way and that I live in a particular um, nationality that likes to put U's in words that, that don't really necessarily usually have U's, um, so on and so forth, right? And then when you add in all the device sensors that are starting to become av available to users, you can infer a lot more types of things, right? I mean, um, the Motorola Zoom, for example, has a barometer on it. Uh, anybody, anybody here know that it had a barometer? It's like a couple people. So I don't know exactly what you can infer with a barometer, but you may be able to actually infer, I guess, if they opened up the Weather Channel app and they're seeing barometric, barometric pressure drop really rapidly, it could say, get to your basement, you know, I don't know. There's a number of different ways that you could infer what they want out of the content when they access it based off of what your sensors are doing on the device. When you add all of these together, you get a really interesting picture of how someone moves through a space, what they're doing, where their attention is spent, how they're interfacing with the device, and so on and so forth. I can't take credit for this graphic, and, and in fact, I'm definitely not the only person that's using this in a presentation. This is pretty well known. You search SlideShare for content or mobile, mobile context, and you'll probably see this image repeatedly. Even a Google image search will probably return this. So whoever's illustrated it, I hope they're just swimming in a Scrooge McDuck room of, of gold bullion, but <laughs> probably not, <laughs> probably not. Okay, so really, when you think about it just very, very closely, when you place something in this context, it, it changes everything. I mean, it just changes the image immediately. This is kind of a fun little exercise. If you've never done that, I don't know. I mean, it's similar to the whole, like, hold up the Leaning Tower of Pisa or something like that, or touch the top of the Eiffel Tower. But, you know, placing, placing elements into a space changes how you access it and how that information is processed and sent to you.